Hi, everybody. Um, so I wanted to start just by sharing a story about a conversation I had with my daughter, my 13-year-old daughter, the other day. So we're driving, and we have these conversations while we're driving. And she says, Mom, I wonder what it's like to be a typical teenager. <laughs> and I said, huh, what do you mean by that? And she said, you know, somebody who's on Facebook and text messaging all the time. So what I thought was interesting about the conversation is that you know, even my daughter, who's a teenager herself, has an idea of what a typical teenager looks like that's very closely allied with the new media technologies that teens use, despite the fact that she's not actually one of those kids, right? So she's more like a budding academic. Um, her use of new media is probably a lot more like mine than like her peers. She tends to go to sites like Etsy.com or she goes to YouTube to look at videos and she has a Tumblr site and she's on Facebook but it's not a real big big deal for her. She was very late on it. And her little brother too, who's an avid gamer, he's 11 years old, he spends most of his time not connected to his mobile phone, he's not on Facebook, but really connected to these specialized sites that cater to his gaming interests. So one of the things that I think is interesting about our debates right now about kids and new media and learning is how even though we all know and recognize the fact that young people's experiences, their identities are just as diverse as adults, for some reason, when we talk about technology, there's sort of this flattening effect about the digital generation using technologies in very similar ways, when if you look at it closely and if you think about it commonsensically, of course young people's media use is just as stratified as any other kind of activity that people engage in. And part of what I want to do in this talk is really to start questioning sort of the diversity of youth experience with new media and how that relates to questions of equity, access, and learning opportunity. So there's a lot of talk these days about whether technology, new technology is good or bad for learning. And then you get the proponents saying digital generation's awesome, active, empowered, engaged learning. And then you get the detractors who are saying dumbing down, distraction, social isolation. Um, you know, all of these sort of declines of traditional literacy. And what's often common across both the boosters and debunkers of these new technologies is the fact not only that it has a strongly technically determinist frame, but the fact that it ignores the diversity of youth experience with new media. And the thing that really worries me about those conversations is the focus on individual outcomes like distractibility, addiction, and those things that a lot of people worry about, um, it's, these are legitimate concerns, but they do tend to deflect attention to what I think is actually the much more profoundly scary risk of new media, which is a growing equity gap between young people who have access to these much more empowered, engaged, um, sort of super powered forms of learning with digital media and those kids who don't. So we can debate outcomes of engagement all we want, but the thing that's really important, I think, to have on the public agenda is really the question um, of who is getting access to the kinds of experiences that are productive and engaging, um, and who is not, and what are the factors contributing to that. Um, so my argument for you today is that we really need to move fairly swiftly and aggressively in order to move away from the debates about whether technology is universally good or bad for learning and really start to think of what we can do in order to maximize the opportunities, minimize the risks for more young people in terms of their engagement to productive learning opportunities. And I'll do this um, by first giving a little bit of an overview of the research that has led to this um, perspective. Um, and then talk about some work that's coming out of a much broader range of projects in the MacArthur Foundation's Funded Digital Media and Learning Initiative, where I've had the opportunity to, to collaborate across research and practice and design around a model we're developing called Connected Learning. <clears throat> okay, so to start a little bit um, on the research, so the Digital Youth Project was um, one of the first two projects out of the gate for MacArthur's Digital Media and Learning Initiative. Henry Jenkins' New Media Literacies Project was the other one. And it was really the start of a broad sort of exploratory mission around the question of how kids were learning differently based on their engagement with new media. 
And it was quite different from a lot of other educational efforts around educational technology in that our focus was really at youth-driven social and recreational practices outside of formal educational environments. And our starting hypothesis was really that the most or at least many of the most interesting and innovative forms of learning and engagement with new media were happening in these more peer-driven, youth-driven kinds of environments, and that very little research had actually looked at that. So we went out with a large team. We conducted a lot of case studies around young people's um, engagement with internet, uh, games, and digital media production. And I won't get into all of the details of the findings, but what I did want to give you was just a very quick overview of some of the top level findings of our research. Okay. So the first important finding was that we discovered, not surprisingly, a pretty profound and resilient generation gap in how young people and the older generation viewed the value of online participation. Now this is shifting a little bit now that grown-ups are on Twitter and Facebook and we're seeing the rise of intergenerational gaming families. So even in the three years since we really wrapped up our field work, we're starting to see a cultural shift where maybe this generation gap is closing. But I think there's still a persistent perception among parents and teachers that activities like gaming and social media use are a waste of time and a distraction from learning rather than something that is inherently a support for productive forms of learning. Uh, the other thing um, that we really focused our research on was, so young people are spending a tremendous amount of time with these new technologies. What are they getting out of it? And we found that there were a variety of learning outcomes that you could look at, but they clustered roughly um, in two areas. One is sort of baseline forms of literacy that have to do um, literacies and competencies that have to do with young people's participation in the kind of everyday peer negotiations that are increasingly be being mediated uh, by new technologies, whether it's mobile or social or gaming technologies. And because it's completely ubiquitous now in youth culture, just as part of hanging out with friends, they're picking up all kinds of fairly sophisticated technical skills of getting information, of modifying media, of understanding how to communicate in a variety of channels. So, you know, if 10 years ago I'd said almost every American teenager knows how to build a website, that would have been a pretty preposterous claim, but in the post-MySpace era, it's totally commonplace that kids acquire these literacies. There's always somebody you can ask because you know that there's that ability and skill embedded in your peer culture with an easy access. And this goes for technical literacies as well as the sort of more social competencies of how you manage privacy, how you deal with sort of sharing information and gossip, appropriate norms for you know, dating and heterosexual negotiations, all of these things. They're not things that kids always get right, but these online spaces are increasingly places in which kids are working this out, developing norms for social behavior, and that kids who are shut out from these kind of forms of participation are not always fully equipped to be able to participate in what it really means to be part of a network public in the 21st century. It's a baseline form of social participation competency that kids need to acquire. Now, apart from those baseline forms of literacies, competencies that kids are acquiring, where we're really looking at in the next phase of the work is what we found a minority of young people engaging in. So not you know, the 90%, the 95% saturation of things like Facebook and, peer, and um, text messaging and peer culture, but really we found that a small minority of kids were taking to the online world to do truly extraordinary things. So these are the kids who have a million views on YouTube, who are mobilizing on Facebook causes, who are modifying games, you know, all those amazing things that get picked up in the celebratory discourse of the digital generation. That is definitely happening, and we found it in our research. But we also found that it was only a small minority of kids doing it. Now, why is that? When the online world hands these opportunities to kids, right? And then it's a tiny minority of kids who are doing it. So that's the problem that we really left um, struggling with in our work um, after the Digital Youth Project wrapped up. Um, so, 
Our most important set of findings in terms of the implications for our current implementation and practice was really centered on understanding the diversity in ways in which kids engage with you media and starting to tease apart how different um, genres of youth culture, youth practice, institutional norms shape the pathways that kids take into participating, engaging with different forms of media. Now the distinction between what we called friendship driven and interest driven participation is a really resilient one within youth culture. It's not a new media thing, but we're finding it replicating in online sites right now in really interesting ways. So friendship driven participation is that sort of baseline hanging out with your friends, flirting, trying to look good, trying to um, you know, gain status and popularity in the peer culture. It's that stuff we all remember from high school happening in the cafeteria and the locker rooms and the hallways from school. Now, that is totally being replicated online. In, um, when we were doing our research, it was instant messaging and MySpace. Now it's Facebook and text messaging in this country. But basically, the online infrastructures for friendship-driven participation replicate the social structure of the school and the community. And from a learning perspective, um, there's not a whole lot more you can push, although there's a lot of important work about, um, you know, around how kids can manage privacy and peer relations and things like that online, um, which is very important. But in contrast to the friendship-driven mode, interest-driven learning and participation is really about the lives of the geeks, freaks, the dorks, the creative kids, the kids who are at the margins of the standard social hierarchy within a high school. So these are the kids who are affiliating based on passion and interests and knowledge-driven kinds of activities. And these are the kids who are tending towards um, a few years, until recently, LiveJournal was probably the platform for a lot of these interest-driven affiliations. Now it's starting to shift to Tumblr, as well as a whole host of other specialty sites that are really about young people affiliating across ages. These are often intergenerational communities based on specialized interests, getting good at something, uh, political and civic mobilization in a much more knowledge-driven mode um, rather than a hanging out mode. And that's what we call the geeking out context in our work. Um, so the thing we found is whether it's Facebook or MySpace or the cafeteria at school, the age segregated peer groups that kids get thrown into by accident of geography or parental selection for, of schools, they're not always the best context to support, they're not the best peer context to support knowledge-driven, self-directed learning and deep identity based on passionate interests. In a given peer group, now this differs based on the high school, but it's often profoundly uncool to care deeply about something. And so that kids have mechanisms for hiding these kinds of identities if they don't want it to translate to downward social mobility in school. Now the online world suddenly offers an opportunity for kids to affiliate and connect with others who share these passionate interests in a way that's not bound by the social status hierarchies of this high school. And that is an extremely interesting opportunity as an educator. Uh, so let me make this a little bit more concrete uh, by talking about one young person who was interviewed uh, by CJ Pasco, one of our collaborators in the Digital Youth Project. Uh, and she was based in the San Francisco Bay Area, 17 years old at the time of the research. And her passionate interest was really in creative writing and fantasy-based media. Uh, so she um, learned about uh, online role-playing boards from a couple of her friends for, from school. So these are sites where young people get together and they uh, interactively write fiction together. And she, you have to write this character application, basically the description of the character you play on the site. She stayed up all night to write her character application. She submitted it. She got glowing reviews from the site moderators, was really excited. And by participating in this online site, she was really able to connect with, with a much broader community of peers who shared this passionate interest, even though she had a couple friends from school who sh were also on the site. And she started doing a lot of collabor collaborative writing with um, young people around the country. I think she also had a collaborator in Spain. Uh, and she got really immersed in this activity. So here's uh, just uh, some text I excerpted from another role-playing site. And 
What I want to highlight here is really the ethic of reciprocity that you see in these environments where everybody who's participating is both a writer and a critic, and the assessment, the sense of trying to get good at something is really being supported and shared within a peer context. And here she's talking about the difference between the writing that she does in school uh, versus the writing that she's doing in the online role-playing uh, site. So in the online role-playing world, um, all of the people in her community are taking the writing very seriously. They're constantly critiquing each other. Um, she's not doing it for an external assessment for a grade, but really for um, the pleasure of participating in this community and improving um, in a way that's driven by her own interests and passions and this nurturing, creative community that really respects and appreciates her work. Now, what was extremely interesting about Clarissa that made her different from most of the kids, almost all of the kids who we talked to as part of our study, was she was able to take the work she did in the role-playing world and make it uh, visible and consequential in a positive way to the adult-facing world. So what she did is she submitted a 100-page screenplay that she developed based on her role-playing writing for a school assignment. And in her college application essays, she wrote about her role-playing work um, and gave samples of it um, as evidence of her interest in becoming a writer and a screenwriter. And she attributes the skills she acquired in her online role-playing world as a big um, part of the reason why she got into some very good colleges that she didn't think she would otherwise have access to. So if we break apart a little bit what Clarissa's learning environments look like, she started from the um, initially with a strong personal interest and affinity to fantasy-based media and her aspiration to be a writer and her interest in writing. And she was able to develop friendships that part of them were in her local community, but importantly, the online community really expanded her community and her peer network that supported the development of these interests. And she was able to interact with um, young people of multiple ages, many of who um, had greater expertise that she could aspire to that really pushed her learning much further than what she could have achieved within the context of the two or three friends in her local community who shared this interest. So the online world became a mediator for her to really bring together a sense of community and peer support um, in service of this interest-based uh, learning. Now, the piece, again, that was different about Clarissa and highly unusual was her ability to advocate for her interest in sites of power, right? So she was able to translate the learning that she was taking from the informal sector and make it visible and relevant to sort of career readiness kinds of contexts, to college applications, these high stakes gatekeeping contexts. This is highly unusual. And it's part of um, really the challenge um, of our work right now um, is to um, understand what kids need in order to be able to move their learning that's happening within these informal and peer-driven environments and make them connected, consequential, and relevant um, to uh, civic and political engagement, to career trajectories, and to academic achievement. So, what we're doing right now um, after the um, Digital Youth Project wrapped up is really to start developing a model of what we're uh, calling connected learning, um, which is a set of, a, a sort of learning philosophy and a set of design principles that's really trying to understand what it takes to support learning that's really grounded in young people's passionate interests, their sense of cultural identity and affiliation, that's supported by their peer group and community, but that's also consequential for the kind of learning that is, and visibility, that's going to, uh, visibility of learning that's going to serve them in their adult lives. So the problem we have in a lot of the sort of happy digital youth kind of discourse is that kids get really good at stuff, right? They become really good gamers, or they become really good fan fiction writers. But that still stays in the sort of youth-driven world um, that doesn't get translated, brought into sites of achievement and power that have consequence for their longer-term trajectories. So we can celebrate the incredible activism 
of a um, guild leader in World of Warcraft or um, you know, <laughs> an amazing uh, fan artist. But unless those of us in the adult world make that learning relevant, visible, and connected into longer term adult facing trajectories, those forms of learning, um, you know, they may become lifelong passion and hobbies, which is great, but I also think that there's a huge opportunity here for young people to realize and um, be able to exploit the kinds of competency, skills, orientations, their ability for self-directed learning, their understanding of what it takes to mobilize and advocate for their own interests and passions um, that will serve them in adult life regardless of what situation they find themselves in. And this is what um, we're really challenged to start uh, developing a model for in a much more robust way right now. Uh, so one of the challenges in our work right now on the research side is really uh, to do much more robust um, testing of this model empirically, uh, both to understand why is it that more kids aren't like Clarissa, what kinds of supports in the environment characterize kids who have discovered or built or um, been able to achieve these sorts of connected learning outcomes. And we have some hypotheses, like you tend to see within very privileged families a well-developed apparatus for supporting kids' interests and for a language for how young people in fairly privileged environments advocate for their interests in their college resumes and all these other things. We know families like that, but what does that really look like empirically? Does that sort of anecdotal evidence that we kind of know from experience really hold up if we look across a wide range of demographics? So we're doing research right now in trying to understand really the factors that differentiate the kids who are already turning to these more informal learning opportunities and further able to connect them into sort of career and academic uh, context. We also need to do a lot more research in understanding the outcomes of these forms of learning. So when I talk about this stuff, most people can say, oh, I had an experience like that, right? When you have an experience that integrates these different aspects of your life, a supportive community, a passionate interest, and like recognition and celebration of how awesome you are, you know, you remember that experience and it, it's something that stays with you, but it's very difficult to operationalize this in terms that educators would understand and that can really stand up to the much more clearly articulated apparatus of traditional and standardized outcomes. Because by their very nature, these outcomes are diverse, non-standardized, and very difficult to measure. So we're doing work right now in trying to develop some alternative assessments, ways of thinking about dispositions, metacognitive capacities, preparation for future learning, and different kinds of constructs that can really enable us to make an argument why it's not domain-specific knowledge, that we should be looking at as much as an underlying disposition for learning and capacity for future learning that's the most important outcome. This is an incredibly difficult challenge and we need a lot of help with it. Um, the other thing that is actually incredibly exciting about working with the Digital Media and Learning Initiative is that we're starting to do much more work which is in the design research area which is saying, look, we have these ideas, we have these examples, we have the proof of concept of how amazing these new technology affordances can be for providing access to new kinds of learning opportunities. What can we do to design spaces that are bringing more kids into this? So just to touch on a few experiments, um, examples that are coming out of the Digital Media and Learning Initiative. So the UMedia sites, um, well the UMedia site uh, at the Harold Washington Library, which is the main downtown library um, in Chicago, the library gave the initiative 5,000 square feet to build a youth, only, a teen only youth media, a new media center, which is populated uh, by young people as well as mentors and areas of digital production. So, um, you know, mentors who really embody these, these passionate interests. Um, and this is a space that was designed based on a lot of our findings from the Digital Youth Project in that it's not only about giving young people specialized workshops and formal educational opportunities, but it's a space um, that has both, that has hanging out, messing around, and geeking out spaces and opportunities. It's the only space in the library that kids can come and bring their food, be really loud, play rock band together, as well as mess around with technology and have access to expert peers and mentors. So again, it's increasing that exposure and that intake 
and developing a community and a peer context that supports an interest-based identity. And since the space opened two years ago, it's been buzzing with activity. <clears throat> it's a drop-in center, um, over 100 kids a day, primarily um, urban youth who wouldn't otherwise have access to these kinds of mentoring opportunities and technologies. Um, this, so this has been a really exciting experiment for us. Um, the U Media sites are scaling to, I think, three more sites this year, <clears throat> 10 more sites um, for the next three years, supported by the MacArthur Foundation and the Institute for Museum and Library Services. <clears throat> the other example, which many of you probably know about, is um, the Quest to Learn schools that have really been, are being built um, under Katie Salen's leadership, and I think she'll be talking about them later this event, so I'd encourage you to go to her talk. Um, but these are schools, one in New York City here, um, just a few blocks from here, and another which opened in Chicago this fall, which is schools based on a game-based pedagogy where um, the state standards and curriculum are really mobilized around collaborative questing and missions that are built so that young people's learning of things like language arts and fractions are mobilized around them trying to achieve something together in a need-to-know basis. And again, just like the Umedia sites, this is a model of starting from youth-driven affiliation, interest, and identity, building a peer culture that supports that identity, and making the learning from those environments visible and consequential for academic achievement and career readiness. So again, it's all based on this model of what it takes to translate between these kinds of learning environments. The last example I'll mention, which Trevor also mentioned in his opening remarks, is our collaboration with the Mozilla Foundation around an open badge infrastructure. So one of the big challenges of working in the informal sector is the fact that the learning happens all over the place. It's non-institutionalized. It's unstructured. It's very difficult to make visible um, in contexts where suddenly you're being assessed and evaluated and having to deal with gatekeeping stuff. So this is a very early experimental effort where Mozilla is building an infrastructure where people can build assessments and badges that make it, the learning visible and transportable across contexts. And to, the DML initiative is funding a competition for people developing um, these kinds of alternative assessment systems as well as doing research on them. So again, it's about another model for how you really address that interface between the youth-driven space, and the adult-facing world of assessment, achievement, and opportunity. So our theory of change, it's really centered on the fact that in the best circumstances, new technology can really lower the barriers of access to connected learning experiences, that it can help really connect the dots between these diverse spheres of um, learning that young people kind of navigate through in their everyday lives. For most young people, the learning that they have in the formal context, the kind of learning that's valued in their peer popularity negotiations, and the kind of learning that's related to their passionate interests, these are disparate and disconnected spheres of activity for most young people. We feel like you, new media, particularly social media, network media, digital media production that enables kids to have visibility and voice, self-expression, can really start changing the dynamic to make this kind of opportunity available, not just to privileged kids born into creative class families, but to a much broader um, sector. And so that's really the vision that we're trying to push. We're seeing that privileged kids and highly motivated young learners like Clarissa are already building these connected learning experiences. Um, but we really need a much more proactive agenda for learning and education to make sure that these opportunities are available not just to the highly motivated and privileged um, and exceptional youth, but to a much more broader cut of society. Thank you. <laughs>